We are delighted to host a lecture by John D. Anthony, freelance sculptor and educator here today. Mr. Anton is a sculptor and educator, and so we welcome you, Mr. John. Please come. Okay, today I'm going to talk about Western sculpture and share some thoughts on how sculpture in Europe and America have been affected by social change. Uh, sculpture is a language that fuses materials with ideas, and the perce perception of sculpture is immediate and sensuous existing in the present. Sculpture is experienced in our direct dimension. And from the beginning of human experience, uh, it says we are able to touch, if we're able to touch something as, child, as uh, babies, we, don't, we, are, we can't focus as babies. All we see is light, we don't see form. But if we touch something, it's believable. So this goes back, I think, to the beginnings of sculpture when people were trying to understand their place in the universe and created idols. Uh, they gave form to what was, was not, what was not touchable existing. So the first idols were sculptures and people, early peoples had special places to med meditate upon our place in the universe. I was at the some of your important uh, shrines or the caves, Vajanta and so on. Very impressive. Uh, and they, they were interested, the early peoples, in controlling nature and the forces that were uncontrollable. So these are different idols. Hellenistic sculpture, they are in the times of the ancient Greeks, about 500 years before Christ, BC is when they think that sculpture, after so many thousands of years, started to go down because painting started to take over. And Hellenistic sculpture, they think, at least in the Western society, was the beginning of this. If the historians look at history and sculpture disappears, it's an indication that, the, that there was a, some, something happened very bad in the, in, the, in the society. Maybe they had a plague, or maybe they were overcome in war. And, and so I, I, I talk about this because in some ways nothing ever changes. The more things change, it never changes. Um, however, in our own time, we live in a, a, a very temporal uh, kind of existence with this electronic media. Uh, there, up until about 75 years ago, there was nothing there but desert, and here we've put up all this crazy monumental images, and we, I, you know, you wonder, are, are they sculpture or are they not sculpture? At least I do. So we, we're the art community. I'm sure many of you here are, are the art community. And I, I read recently today that it's the artists themselves and I believe this, that are actually the biggest supporter of the arts. At least this is true in the United States. Artists are often asked to subsidize exhibitions out of their own pocket. Even if you're at a museum, uh, they, you know, they don't pay you for the time to install your work or, or so on. But we love our work. We wouldn't be doing it. So uh, and each artist finds their way on how to survive and how to find a way to get their work out into the world before an audience. And when I studied at CalArch, this is a very famous school in California, they, were, it, don't misunderstand me because my European friends often understand, but th their emphasis was as an artist, how do you find your audience? And at the time we didn't have the technology of the, of the, internet, of the internet, but if you, if you think about it, that's one way to reach a, a vast, thousands of people. So, you know, I don't use it myself, but that's one way that you might possibly find an audience. And I want to say that the art world at large is inclusive. You don't have to have a degree, you know, which is interesting, and it's, I think it's a good thing. And one does not have to have a Okay, I said that. And then once you're an artist, is finished with school, all that matters is your portfolio. 
And all artists have to find a way to, to survive. There are many answers to this problem, and each artist solves it in their own way, and often by taking a day job in the United States. I don't know what the situation here is, but they often, quote, take a day job. And the majority of artists never sell any of their work. It's only the top 10%, 5 to 10%. Um, and as an art professor, I, I told my students that they, uh, I was invited to Croatia to help them. Uh, I was the first foreign professor invited to Croatia to help them fulfill their EU, to help them join the EU to fulfill, fulfill the Bologna Agreement and decentralize their educational system. So they were, wanted an educational system more like the United States instead of having a national academy and all everybody went to the national academy. In the United States, you have many different schools with different ways of doing things. So, But uh, as an art professor, when I was in Croatia, I told my students that they had to be brave and they had to be successful and to be successful, they, one had to have three things, three blessings. You had to have one, determination, and you had to have talent, and you had to have luck. And all things considered, uh, we love what we do, and we really wouldn't be alive unless we did create as artists. Now, through the ages, and even today, there are fundamental commissioners of sculpture that have been basically the church, the state, and private patrons. Uh, for the first, the church, question mark. And religious institutions, we were talking about this on a tour, a brief tour today at, the, at your National Gallery, and what happened uh, during the, the uh, 19th century here where the priests were uh, in a ba basically pushed out of the art. But uh, in the West, it took around 200 years for the Christian church to become the official re uh, religion of the Roman Empire, with Constantine, was, that you saw his portrait, was the, was the first Roman emperor that rejected paganism. And then Constantinople was established as the capital of Byzantium, and from this culture we see painted icons. Uh, becoming the dominant art form over sculpture. And during the Romanesque period after this, uh, re returned mainly as ball re sculpture returned, but it was mostly as ball relief. And in general, in the past, the art had an educational value, uh, educational purpose of, as well to educate people about the religion. So I see that as well in your own temples, the ancient temples. Uh, when I asked uh, the guide this week, uh, we were, uh, about this ancient sculpture in your country, according to the guide that I had, he said there was no canon, there was no particular way that was by law or by, to, the artist had freedom to, to interpret the, the story. And then the second patron would be the state, and that's what you have a lot now today. I'm a Example, I'm a guest of your state, thanks to Professor Doss and his encouragement. And the state for centuries has been and continues to be a major patron of contemporary sculpture and art in general. And this affects sculpture because sculpture is expensive to make. And this government in general has duty to honor its heroes and uh, have some monuments to their, to their political agenda. And then finally, there's a private sponsor, aside from the church and state, is uh, the rise of that has been the, the industrialist, corporate executives and so on. And they're the new aristocracy of our times. However, there are royal collectors in the Middle East still. And they affect what's collected nowadays, and they also affect the art market, you know. And uh, so their collections are usually transferred to museums and often they're on boards of museums. Now, how has social change affected the appearance of contemporary Western sculpture? Maybe here too. 
uh, the period from 1871 to 1914 witnessed accomplishments in Western science. First was the idea of Darwinism, which came in 1859. I don't know how influenced you were here in India by Darwinism, but this was a big influence. It still is, it's still controversial about the idea that uh, we're descended from apes. Uh, and then there was Einstein's theory of relativity. And this said that in physics, there's no absolute space or time. And the belief in Newton's clockwork universe was dismantled. And so what we've, and then there was Sigmund Freud that launched psychiatry or psychology. And he questioned our rationality and that he said that we have a subconscious. And I'd be very curious to be what, uh, to hear what you people think about this, you know, about meditation and the subconscious and so on. And I'd be interested to know how this affects your artwork. Now I want to move on to Marcel Duchamp and Brancusi because they're, it's fashionable nowadays. We were talking about this with the guy. I, I was touring your National Gallery briefly, but it, it's fashionable now in the West to go back to the roots of modernism around 100 years ago. Yeah, around 100 years ago, maybe a little bit more. Uh, th there, things are going so fast in the West now, there's no ism anymore. No, no futurism, no cubism, no nothing like this. And uh, everyone's complaining here as well as back home and in Europe. Uh, it seems to be a, a decline right now. So there's, there's in interest in, in going back and kind of getting back to the roots of modernism. So Marcel Duchamp uh, was a French. All right, well, every century has more than one direction in art. And I chose Marcel Duchamp as one direction as the early modernist and uh, Brancusi, the, the sculpture, as the other direction. So first with, with uh, this, is, this is Marcel Duchamp. And he's known to be, uh, he was a characterist, cartoonist before he became an artist. And he, is, He's very skeptical, and also he was his. He was in a time where science was becoming the answer to everything, and science is very skeptical. And so was Marcel Duchamp, and they were at the, the artist and everybody at this time uh, uh, around 1900 was being affected by machines. So I think we're in a similar period now with this new technology. I mean, in, in the future, it won't be too long before people won't be driving their own cars. At least that's what I understand the United States. And we're also dealing with virtual reality. Uh, you can talk to somebody on the internet. You don't know if they're really that person or not, and so on. And Brancusi, the artist hand is always visible in the technique. With Duchamp, it's more machine-like. And Brancusi is considered one of the most influential sculptors of the 20th century. And he made his, his uh, sculpture in a traditional, more traditional sort of way. But he also rejected the, tra the traditional views of sculpture at his time. So at the, at the time, that they, at, around that time, uh, before the modernist movement, where they wanted art for art's sake, was the the national academies were established, and they promoted um, the the political point of view of the government. And at at that time, they wanted art to be if a, a noble subject would be a historic subject instead of a religious subject, it switched into sort of a secular sub uh, area where it was what the government was interested in. Now I'd like to share some direct quotes from sc sculptors. Um, you don't ha have many chances to hear directly from the artist 
nowadays about their artwork, so I thought it would be a good thing to, to share the, their thoughts. And the first one is Tony Grug. You probably know Tony Grug, and his, his high school studies were working method is something like an obsessive scientific experiment into the nature of matter and objects, and he lives and works in Germany. And here's his quote. I think, I think we should not leave the shape of the future to politicians and businessmen. There should be some other activity, even if it's only a very small activity, such as sculpture, to find new forms, alternative shapes that would help to produce better imaginations, better dreams, better fantasies, because we would have a better, stronger visual language. That is what I feel sculpture making can do. To get out of this dull reality, we have to make the shape itself, challenging the material, looking at the shape and learning from things. And having the opportunity to touch all these different things, to feel the difference, in a word, to learn from them because they all have different qualities, they all have something. This idea of extension into space and material is actually the new potential of sculpture. And People in general feel that since about 1960, sculpture is in a new golden age. I don't know about here, but in the West, they feel it's a new golden age because of the, of the new technology. There are all kinds of new materials that sculptors are working at with besides the traditional marble or bronze, etc. Uh, this is Richard Deacon. His art is a process art. And he's described his way of working as a means of something that is indestruct indescribable. And his work speaks of an interest in systems, Angel of the North by D Gromley. And he says, Gromley says, sculpture is silent still, and, it's, and in its best examples, it uses that quality to great effect in a world where everything is mobile. It's American sculptor, Richard Serra. He does uh, very large scale sculptures. And he says, I always thought the sculpture had been the handmaiden to painting. And having worked in industry and seen what had been done in terms of cantilever and counterbalance, he worked in a factory. I knew there was another way of coming at sculpture. not exactly by putting principles of the engineering to work, but by using them in a way that took the focus off the pictorial aspect and by using gravity, weight, load, and balance to redirect the viewer to a different way of thinking about space and time in relation to material. This is Kiki Smith. She's uh, German-born but uh, raised in America. And she says, art is a place where people express their consciousness and it is an infinite space. It's a meeting of it's a meeting space of different technologies and different thought processes, curiosities, and desires. Since it can have infinite forms and subject matter, art is an extremely free space. Richard Tuttle. He says, I always put the last things first and the first things last. And it's all hidden behind the motion of learning by doing. Thank you.